Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to our participants and panelists from Curaçao, Aruba, St. Martin, and Ardabes Islands. A good evening to our participants based in the Netherlands and even a, a, a participant from Portugal, University of Madeira, welcome, and the US as well. My name is Steven Damiana and I'm from Curaçao Chamber of Commerce and Industry, but in this setting, I am representing Europe Direct Curaçao as the local manager based in Curaçao. I would like to welcome you all to our first webinar for today, our webinar on blue and green. Before we start, a couple of uh, house rules. All our panelists will have their presentations, and at the end, you will be able to ask your questions. To pose your questions, you can feel free to start writing them down in the Q&A section, which you will see below. And after each speaker finishes their presentation, you will be able to uh, get your question answered so you don't forget what we were going to ask. Our panelists will then uh, answer them after having performed their presentations. If you already know to whom you wish to ask a question, please state the name of the presenter and your question. The session will be recorded and will be eventually posted on the social media of Europe Direct Curaçao, so on Facebook and LinkedIn. And for now, I would like to pass the floor now on to our moderator for today, Mrs. Germaine Request. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you for your opening uh, remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, invited guest speakers, welcome to our webinar about blue and green and in particular the impact of climate change on our islands. We have, uh, I am Jimena Request, I am a researcher at the University of Curaçao and I will be moderating this webinar in my capacity of uh, manager of the Europe Direct uh, Curaçao from the Netherlands. We have a wonderful program today for you and uh, a lineup of wonderful speakers. So let me introduce our speakers uh, to you. First keynote speaker is uh, Mr. Filomeno Marchena. Um, Mr. Marchena is professor at University of uh, Curaçao, uh, Faculty of Engineering. Professor Marchena is also UNESCO Chair of Sustainable Water Technology and uh, Management. After the uh, presentation of uh, Mr. Marchena, we will continue with a dialogue session. And we have invited two speakers to, um, to uh, enter the dialogue with us. So the first speaker will be Gilberto Morrishow. He's a member of the Youth Sounding Board of the European Commission. And our second guest speaker for the dialogue session is Mrs. Shudrik Peters, second deputy territorial authorizing officer for the European Development Fund for Curaçao. After the dialogue session, we will continue with a funding uh, opportunity session. So the session will be about uh, what kind of opportunities for funding on blue and green are available. For this session, we have invited Joseph Stufer. He's a senior policy officer of the Dutch Research Council, NAO, also the coordinator of uh, the Caribbean research at NAO. Then we will um, pass the word to Mrs. Vanessa Torre. Uh, Vanessa Torre is director of the EU desk, and this is a unit of the Foreign Economic Cooperation Division at the Ministry of Economic Development of Curaçao. So we are very glad to have uh, the guest speakers uh, uh, today and also very happy that you have uh, joined us at this webinar. So let me um, give the floor to our first keynote speaker, Professor Marcena. Mr. Marcena, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you, Ms. Jermaine. Uh, thank you also for the nice introduction. Um, it's really an honor for me. I'm sorry, good, good morning to everyone and bon dia natur. It's all, always an honor for me to be invited as a keynote speaker, especially at this webinar, Europe Direct Blue and Green, Climate Change OCTs. And the title of my keynote presentation is Climate Change Vulnerability on the Leeward Dodge Caribbean ABC Island. I'm representing the University of Curaçao of, as professor on the UNESCO Chair of Sustainable Water Technology and Management.
I have. Okay. Um, in this presentation, after a very short introduction, I will elaborate shortly on climate change as challenges and experiences during hurricane period and factors that we may use to reduce climate change vulnerability. And I will conclude and my presentation with some concluding remarks. As we all know, and also as presented at the last climate change conference of the UNESCO International Hydro Intergovernmental Hydrological Program for Latin America in the Caribbean, our islands are very arid with practically no freshwater resources. Practically, we don't have surface water and groundwater. And if there is any groundwater, because of the geological structure, it will be very brackish. The water retention capacity of the soils is also very poor, so rainwater rapidly runs off to the sea. We may have some rainwater, still have rainwater harvesting in dams and cisterns. As you can see in these pictures, representing rainwater runoff to the sea, uh, rainwater harvesting, sur surface water harvesting in natural dams. And especially in the right hand picture, you can see in the colonial uh, period that our houses were built with cisterns and very strong build that, can, that may resist hurricanes. ABC Islands used to be formally denoted by the Spanish conquistadores as useless islands, Islas Inutiles, maybe because there is no um, water resources. But actually, in the first half of the 20th century, we became really very prosperous because of the introduction of the oil refinery. In these pictures, you can see the Isla refinery in Curaçao and the Valero refinery in Aruba that were for many decades the primary pillar for the economy, economy in both of the islands. They also represent our share in the environmental pollution. They were great pollute, polluters. So we have also a share in the globally climate change effects that we are seeing today. The introduction of the oil refinery also made necessary already at the end of the 1920s and the beginning of 1930s, the introduction of seawater desalination, especially for the increasing population growth since the introduction of oil refinery. And both oil refinery and seawater desalination make possible the introduction of the flourishing tourism industry in the 1950s, which further enhanced the booming economy and drastically changed the environment and our mindset. Farmer farmers and fishermen became industry workers, some of them uh, business managers. And so at the end, we changed our back to the environment. As you can see in the, these pictures, how the environment has changed since the introduction uh, in 1956 uh, in Aruba. As you compare the uh, environment, the, the beaches with palms has changed for a cement-based uh, uh, tourism area. So, the industrial activities brought prosperity, economic growth, and especially westernization, which slowly changed the pre-industrial quality of living in harmony with the environment into a cement-based urbanism, which increases the island's vulnerability to climate change. Now, these many studies shows that we are facing very dramatic threats of climate changes, which will increase severe drops followed by torrential rainfalls. We'll also increase the strengths and frequency of hurricanes. We will experience more profound sea level rise, 
and what more uh, uh, important is it will increase the occurrence of tsunamis according, according to recent studies. So I, I believe that the Dutch Caribbean islands are very vulnerable for these challenging climate change effects and especially the geographical location of our islands, as you can see in these pictures. If we are hit by a hurricane, the possibility to support and help each other will be practically not there because all of us will experience damages and the impacts of a hurricane. As I already mentioned, the vulnerability is enhanced by the cement-based urbanism because cities, industrial sites, and neighborhoods were simply built in the pathways of ephemeral streams. And most important, many of the natural sites where surface water infiltrate to the groundwater, which we call it in Aruba Bulido, were condemned by construction, leading to inundation, land erosion, soil degradation, and destruction. And as these pictures illustrate, whatever we do, the water will get back to its nat natural flow path and causing a lot of destruction. Now, in the past hurricane periods, our ABC islands have experienced different devastating effects, especially of hurricane tails what we call it in, in, in locally, and is the, actually the most weak part of an hurricane. And I will give some examples of the experiences, mostly of Aruba, because I don't have pictures from the other islands. As you can see in these pictures, in two successive years, 1954 and 55, we have experienced dramatic impacts of the Hurricane Hazel and Janet. And you can see a lot of inundation, a lot of people have to flood their houses to save their lives. And in 1999, we can remember that Hurricane Laney with an eastward path past west and the north direction of our islands. However, very fast, and even though coming from the West have caused devastating um, destruction in the harbor. And, and you can see, as you can see in the right-hand picture, storm surge brought a sunken ship from the deep back to the first surface and threw it practically near the beach at the West Coast of Aruba. And in 19... In 2004, we had a near miss where, uh, when Hurricane Ivan passed very close to our islands. And we have experienced different inundation and destruction. As you can see in this picture, you can notice how very close the eye was near our islands. It causes dramatic inundation, as you can see in this picture in the tourism industry, caused a lot of damage, destruction of the infrastructure. And also a lot of houses were inundated. You can see in this picture how high the level of the water was and most of the people had to be helped and some of them have to flood their houses to save their lives. And also at the southeast coast of Aruba, you can see in these pictures that the uh, storm surge does built up a new reef of the destructed coral reefs, uh, coral stones. Now they are uh, touristic attraction places, but you can see how strong an effect, the effect of a hurricane can be, just the tail. Considering the impacts that we have experienced during storm surges and heavy rainfall, 
I think our islands may not withstand even a category one hurricane. All our experience, I consider as lessons not to learn because after Hurricane Ivan, 12 years after Hurricane Ivan, in November 2016, still you have inundation during one of two hours of heavy rainfall. Despite many projects promised by public departments to, uh, to, to uh, improve our infrastructure. So, regarding reducing climate change vulnerability, I consider one of the most important factors as freshwater security to guarantee food security and especially local communities' awareness. Many people, especially from Aruba, still believe that our islands are blessed. We will not be hit by a hurricane. That is, uh, I think, I hope that will never be the case for our islands. Actually, I have not considered uh, uh, improvement our, of our uh, infrastructure, but that is also a very important point to reduce climate change vulnerability. For freshwater production, I think we don't have to worry as much because our island depends on seawater reverse osmosis desalination. As you can see, those uh, facilities in Aruba, Bonera, Curacao in this picture, simply because the water production facilities have a hurricane contingency plan. They practice all procedures for safe uh, operation security and also for the recovery and restart of production distribution after the hurricane. I have to mention that the desalination facility of Curacao Aqua Electra was since 2005 a transit for a total emergency plan for the, all our uh, desalination facilities. However, a point of concern is and still will be that the facilities are located near the coast. So it is very vulnerable for a tsunami. And to my knowledge, no measure has yet been taken for this. And I don't know if it can be taken also. And one thing that will be suffer much from uh, the hurricane regarding food security is a small scale traditional agriculture. As I mentioned before, climate change will, will increase droughts and torrential rainfalls causing more aridity, soil erosion, seawater infiltration of the scarce groundwater, and the farmers may experience a lot of loss of production. And I have to say, that our islands still depend for about 90 to 95% on import of food supply. These pictures illustrate a very, very, very nice marketplace in Willemstad Curso. I don't know if it still is like this because uh, some years ago when we had problem with import from Venezuela, I heard that it was closed. I don't know actually if that is still the situation. However, at the last climate change conference, of the UNESCO International Hydrological Program Latin America and the Caribbean, SDG 6, freshwater and sanitation for all, was considered the core SDG to achieve the other SDGs. So for me, and also as professor of water management, it is without doubt that water security is essential to safeguard food security. So, it's not a uh, wonder that many government departments and agriculture foundations promote local communities to produce their own food, which for my part is very important, but it can be very misleading when they promote independence of import, which can be also very important to reduce climate change vulnerability. However, we have to think that it takes about 500 liters of water to produce a decent day's worth of food per person. And for an island with 150 inhabitants like Curacao, this is about 274 million cubic meters per year. 
And if we consider that the annual production in Aruba, because of fresh water, is about 13 to 15 million cubic meters, I think we have, we cannot assure production of our own food and make us independent of the import. And I think and believe that the most important factor is still awareness of the local communities to seek solution for the urgent islands climate change vulnerability. And so in this context at the University of Curacao, we have developed a project to introduce the principle of ethno-eco-agricultural engineering approach to redesign environmental harmony again in urbanism based on what I call appropriate technology, which is introducing and incorporating traditional and indigenous knowledge and craftsmanship in our technologies. This picture illustrates a 3D um, design of the smart agriculture uh, system at the University of Curacao, uh, which I want to change to a small scale integrated eco urbanism pilot to support PhD research and other feasibility study. This pilot consists of a small climate and pandemic resilient building, which will be used for lecture and study room for the students. It will contain a green, blue roof and vertical gardens. It will also have a rainwater harvesting system with bias rail, groundwater infiltration, a natural biofilter system for wastewater purification. And I'm very glad that last week we have received uh, financial uh, support from UNESCO Jamaica to start building the biofilter. And I was notified this morning that the construction, construction of this system biofilter has already started yesterday. The pilot will also contain continuous solar evaporation for freshwater production and a combined aquaponic permaculture system with green blue roof technology and alternative energy system for power generation. Actually, the most important objective for constructing this pilot is to have the possibility to get out of our scientific ivory tower to try to effectively reach out and team up with local communities to face the climate change challenges. As you can see in these pictures, already some students and cooperation with a uh, uh, foundation, uh, some Yama, I think it's called, I hope I don't, did, did not pronounce it wrong. They already started to empower and involve the community in building and constructing community gardens for food production. It's a very, very nice uh, and important initiative. So in finishing in my presentation, I will um, say uh, uh, some concluding remarks. As we all know, and as we all should know, the United Nations have designed in 2015 the new development approach toward a safer, healthier, and more prosperous world based on 17 development goals, sustainable development goals in an intertwined framework supported by five pillars, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. It should put our world forward to eradicate and face the uh, anthropogenic impact on nature that causes climate change. I hope, I sincerely hope that our communities knows about this. We have different offices in Aruba and in Curacao, but when I talk to people on the street, most of them don't know about this uh, SDG framework. And to emphasize the anthropogenic impact, I would like to quote a paragraph of the book, Water, a Natural History 
from the American uh, environmental engineer, Alice Outward. It is like this. Water is the blood of land, always in motion. From the rain to the mountain tops, through the forest and plains to the sea, and so to the clouds again. And yet, on the North American continent, the natural water cycle has been changed in a number of ways. As a result, water no longer is no longer able to clean itself naturally. Despite our best legislative efforts, our waterways are still impaired by dredging, by damming, by channeling, by tempering with, and in some cases, eliminating the ecological niches where water cleaned itself. We have simplified the pathways that water takes through the American landscape, and we, and we ended up with dirty water. So, as I always, uh, on different conferences of the UNESCO state, I will restate it again. I am convinced that nature has the capacity to create its own solution as it has already done for billions and billions of years. So with this and the five pillars of the SDG framework in mind, I would like to end my presentation with a heartfelt inspirational message. Let's learn from our mistakes so that we people daily understand that to assure our existence of this planet and enjoy resilient prosperity, we should make peace and live in peace and work in partnership with nature so that we will be part of its solution because by ne ne neglecting this, we may not have options and opportunity anymore in the future. So I hope you have enjoyed my presentation. Thank you for your attention. So back to Jermaine. Yes, thank you, Professor Machena. Thank you for your presentation. Um, as I understand that uh, one point that you made very clear is about the necessity of uh, sufficient uh, water to provide uh, uh, food that we can um, provide for ourselves. So that's no uh, necessity for uh, import of food. Um, I think that's an uh, interesting uh, point of view. And um, um, when I look at the uh, Q&A uh, um, se uh, section of uh, our webinar, I see that uh, there is some uh, there are some questions about uh, also about the water. And um, I don't know if you can um, look at the Q&A session yourself for the uh, questions there, or that you want me to um, to read them for you. Okay, we'll take a look at them. Because if I start with the last yeah, one uh, from Tamira, uh, Tamira La Cruz, and um, she, uh, her remark is that uh, in Curaçao we have many initiatives like uh, the Samyama and the Hofi Sirvan from uh, Otrabanda with Futsa Forest. And um, I, I think that's um, interesting to know what your thoughts are about the fact that um, um, we, is it possible that we can go to a system where we can provide for our own, uh, our own food? Because if I look at your presentation, then um, there are some doubts about uh, that. What are your thoughts about this? Yes, I, I, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very, um, happy about the, those initiatives and very important, especially that they want to empower and involve the community to, to do uh, on farming in the neighborhood to produce their own food, food, sorry. And, but actually what I'm, my problem is that many departments and especially agriculture department promote the, the, the production of our own food, but they forget that according to the water footprint to produce your own food and everyone knows that agriculture is the biggest uh, consumer of water. So we, we have to look at technology, promising technologies are aquaponics and, and, and 
and, and hydroponics. And most recently, they come up with permaculture, synthropic agriculture, and that may be very uh, important and create the possibility to, to improve our food production. But we have to look at the water availability. And UNESCO, some years ago, also pointed out that wastewater treatment may be an important water source for um, agriculture. And we have to look at that. I was also a fervent promoter of construction of capium dam, dams in our um, ephemeral stream in our roads to, to collect seawater and improve um, groundwater infiltration. But we have to be very careful with that and research more on that because it can create also a bigger problem when they are, the, when they are filled with water and Next to that, we get a torrential rainfall. <laughs> so we have to be very careful. And, and what about the rainfall? Uh, is, is, is it true that we have enough rainfall to, um, to solve the problem or the lack of uh, water? No, I think one of the biggest um, um, chance to solve the problem is uh, wastewater purification on the island to purify it, that it can be used as irrigation water for the island and, and, and agriculture. Okay, so that's uh, the, the, more, the most easiest way to uh, solve the problem of the lack of water, correct? Okay, I didn't um, get what you said. <laughs> The last so so you, you're, in your point of view, the uh, rainfall is not the, the solution, but the um, purification of the water, the saltification of the water, that we should uh, look at that uh, possibility as an, uh, as an option? Yes, uh, uh, rainwater collection is one of the options, of course, but you have to be careful, especially if you use uh, the, the ephemeral streams. You see, uh, you have to make a good study of it and check the risk of, of inundation, especially when, when the catching areas are full with water. But that, it is uh, globally an, an important uh, uh, source of water. Yes, I agree with that. And we don't have many uh, rainfall, I, I think, in Curacao no, no. or the islands. It's one of the the main issues uh, from decades already uh, in, in history that uh, agriculture is a difficult uh, um, way of providing uh, our own uh, food because of lack of uh, rainfall, because there is not sufficient rainfall. So if I uh, look at the Q&A uh, uh, questions, uh, the, the last one is uh, from John and John um, is asking about uh, what about looking for water catchment systems and uh, reforestation so that not um, as less possible rainwater goes to the sea so that we, we, we have, we contain the rainwater uh, on the islands itself so that it's not go, that it doesn't go to the sea. Yes, it, it, of course it is what I said, I was a fervent uh, promoter of, of using our uh, ephemeral streams to collect rainwater. Yes as much as possible because before it run off to the sea, of course. But again, we have to, to uh, make sure that we don't harm the environment or cause other problems with inundation. You just have to remember if the dams are full and yes. the days after we have an, uh, already uh, also a an, an, an heavy rainfall, what's going to happen, <laughs> you will have tremendous inundation. So uh, when you come up with a solution, you have to every time look what, what extra effect it may have on the environment or on the people also. Yes, the other aspect. It is, it is our, our, one of our important um, sources, but we have to use it carefully and, and clever. Yes, um, maybe we can address now the, the question that uh, Leopoldo Henriquez has uh, posted uh, in the Q&A uh, uh, session. Can you take a look at that? Sorry, which one? I, I cannot the first understand. One from Leopoldo Henriquez. 
Yeah. Uh, what effect of all water and electricity are concentrated on one location, for example, Puerto Rico? Shouldn't we decentralize the location? Uh, what sometimes um, uh, uh, I think he refers to, to decentralized uh, water production and, and electricity production. That can be uh, helpful because uh, if you if you have only one centralized system and it get hit by a hurricane, you may have problem to restart production and operation. But one way to look at it, and also regarding um, wastewater treatment, decentralized systems are options that we have we can use, especially. Um, in, in, in the small towns, because to construct a, 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 a sewage system where all houses are connected will be very, very costly. And with decentralized system, and especially combine those systems with natural biofilters to purify wastewater can be a very effective option. So decentralized, I'm not against decentralized, but it can be a a good uh, opportunity for sustainable water and electricity production. Yes, but we have to look at all the aspects of uh, this uh, okay. this option. Um, shall we um, um, go to the, the, the dialogue session with um, Mrs. Shudrik Peters? Mrs. Peters, do you have uh, questions for Professor Marcinan about uh, this topic? Oh yes, hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. Hi, hi Mr. Marcina. Um, I thank you so much for this interesting presentation, very insightful. And uh, the information you presented is uh, useful to our territories. Um, specifically, you spoke about the ABC Islands, uh, which as you mentioned, uh, we truly believe that because we are outside the hurricane belt, that we are safe for life. And that's, I mean, uh, we all can see that due to climate change, I mean, uh, it, it's very volatile and uh, unexpected, you know, so you cannot count that because we are outside the hurricane belt that, uh, you know, we will be safe for forever. So I think, as you mentioned, we have to be prepared. And I also truly believe in your statement that you quote um, Alice Outwater. I truly believe that nature has the capacity indeed to create its own solution uh, at as it has already done for a billion of years. And it's doing right now, you know, with the many tsunamis, earthquakes, I mean, the natural hazards, uh, we see it overall. Um, no, specifically, um, uh, bring it back home to our case in this instance, Curacao or the ABC. Um, we are, you know, we are so perfect in making uh, <laughs> drafting reports, and, and uh, we have many reports, as you know, on this topic. Um, uh, however, our National Climate Resilient Plan is dated of 2005, when we were still part of the Netherlands and Paris constellation. Um, it seems like we are not that so diligent in turning vision into actions and in setting four targets, defining initiatives that will take us from where we are at a certain point or moment in time and where we intend to be in, uh, in a few years. Um, what can you advise in terms of developing um, um, roadmaps, mobilizing our financial resources, strategic and operational partnership in relation to climate resiliency and building sustainable and resilient communities? Okay. Um, I totally agree with you, um, Mrs. Peters. One of, one of the I think the biggest problem is that we are, as you said, we are very good in making report, making guideline, manual, but we are very bad in, let's say, put them in operation, meet our targets and so on. And we, we have to have support. And, and I think also we have to involve more the community. See. It, here in Aruba, we have an, uh, a special office for the sustainable development goals. But sometimes when you talk with local people, they don't know 
about SDGs or, or the framework of UN. So <laughs> I think uh, we have to get out of our ivory tower and reach out to the community. And most of the okay. solutions that we are suggesting is we need the community to realize them. And also investment, because uh, what I was told by the Department of Public Works, you see, you can do a lot to improve the infrastructure, but most investments are very large to do it as good as possible. And as you know, should be aware of that. Sorry? But I was going to say, as you know, we have many financial um, challenges, uh, certainly. Um, uh, also due to this uh, um, uh, pandemic, it has worsened. Um, yes. However, however, I believe it's, it's a matter of setting priorities and using the scarce um, uh, resources that you have by, by looking at the needs and setting priorities. And yes. however, as I mentioned already, I miss that, uh, that vision, those visions, to, you know, to turn to, into actions, I miss I, I miss that, and also I yes. miss a roadmap. Um, and once you have that in place, I believe that you can start looking for financial resources. For example, at UNESCO, you know, yeah. that's also awesome because um, um, I heard I heard that you mentioned that UNESCO is uh, is financing UNESCO Jamaica is financing the uh, the ethno eco agricultural engineering at least part of it. The, the, the pie, yes. you mentioned that, yes. and, and uh, uh, very interesting. Yes, I think also, and thank you for <laughs> your interest in that project. And it is also very important if we include um, the, the traditional knowledge of the local community so we can get them involved. I think you, may, uh, you have a very good point. We have to make priorities and a good allocation of the cost. The government can do that. I believe they can do it. And we need, it is also our problem. We have uh, the capacity to set up a lot of research, important research, like the, the, the eco-urbanism pile, but we are lacking financial support. And I hope that now we suddenly got uh, support from UNESCO. They surprised me two, three weeks ago, if I can spend <laughs> some amount of money so for sure. And, and, and and UNESCO always work with, with, with uh, very short deadlines. I had to make it happen within one week. And I was yeah. very glad to, to, to be informed that the students started already yesterday, cleaning their place and try digging. So very nice. And, and we can do a lot. And, and yes. what we have to do is motivate, motivate and, and hope that the government understand that, that eco-urbanism, green infrastructure, blue-green circular economy is very important. Not only to talk about that, but give us uh, financial support to start with the projects. I think you, I cannot you know. say enough that you are very, very right. You have it at the right point. We need it, we need you, the support. You know, the European Development Fund, um, under the 10th European Development Fund, which is uh, um, uh, which ends, you can say, with this year 2021, um, um, we did. I mean, uh, um, urban infrastructure in socially deprived communities and low-income communities, and in that sense, we have been improving and upgrading the communities and try to build, in a sense, better. But however, we have to realize that these funds from the EU are complementary to our own resources. So we are unable to do as much as we like because the funds are also limited. Now, under yeah. the upcoming funds in the future, uh, future I say it's to 2022, for example, the, the emphasis is going to be on building resilient and sustainable communities. And based on that, it reminds me, based on your, your, this, um, your presentation, we are going to retrofit, for example, one school at Terracora to become okay. a um, to become be, to become a shelter, make it hurricane proof, and also okay. community centers, making them hurricane proof and uh, you know and uh, and shelters. And um, we will be also be doing, and that's something that I would love to work with you because I you, maybe you can shed some light on that for me. 
We have um, uh, finances for a feasibility study on a wetland in Terracora and the implementation as such. Now, I heard that you are doing the ethno eco agriculture, <laughs> agricultural engineering. So, agricultural. what is the difference between the two? What is the difference between um, the wetland no, and I, uh, uh, the, there was another professor that coined the word agricultural, but I put it eco agricultural. And Correct. agricultural is not only about um, making houses with green roofs and vertical garden, but try to come up with new designs to incorporate ecosystem in it and incorporate agriculture uh, in, uh, at the residential level. So uh, we can use uh, permaculture, the centropic uh, agriculture technology, all of them. But you, the main point is we're going to design urbanism to, in, uh, to incorporate ecosystem services in it and also to create possibility for agriculture. Okay. That's why I the word agricultural. Yeah. I would love to remain in touch with you because of uh, we will be doing this wetland in Terracora and we are also planning additional um, interventions. So I would love to stay in touch with you, Mr. Marcina. So, you know, we can learn from each other and do it uh, the right way. And I have uh, two I more questions. Yeah. I, I have two more questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No, sorry, no. go ahead. No, I, I want to say that at the University of Curacao, we have a good department of um, agric uh, um, architecture and civil engineering. So we are glad to help you. And, and I'm very glad that, that two, three months ago, we have established together with the Ministry of Economy, also UNESCO Curacao, the Curacao Sustainability Coalition, where we want to promote cooperation with with each other, like to, you want to cooperate with us, you, you're very welcome to do that. And we yeah. we can help you. Mm -hmm. In 20, I believe it's 2019, the Minister of General Affairs, Curacao, signed a collaboration agreement with the University of Curacao. And okay. we worked with the technical faculty. Um, yeah. They were involved in the project that we did at Terracora, the students. So okay. that type of collaboration, we, will, we wish to continue doing so and building more resilient and sustainable with uh, including um, the students of the technical facility. Okay. Um, I, I have one is question. The How do you... or, is the memo of understanding already signed by? Yes, we did sign it in 2019. Okay. Yes, we did sign it. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I have another question, two more questions. Um, how do we, how do you um, see engagement of educational institutions to get more involved in climate change challenges for the purpose of guiding students into careers and professions, which respond to the areas of our greatest needs? You know, in this way, we can ensure the human capital to manage the risks. May I add one other uh, angle also from uh, Tamira uh, Lacruz, because uh, she's also uh, asking about what can private en uh, enterprises and private individuals um, take uh, on in this regard. So what can they do? Not only the educationers, as uh, Jutrik Peters pointed out, but also uh, private enterprises. What can they do? Oof, uh, I hope I understand the question. Good, because I have a lot a problem with a lot of noise, trembling voices and so. Um, I think education is very important and involvement of businesses, enterprises are very important. We have to work together. Let's make a workshop together and check how we can sustain each other. Education is very important. We have to start already, I think, at the primary level and secondary level to teach them about climate change and what are the challenges that we are facing. And so they can go to the community, as we say to in Aruba to Buchiwan, and also educate him about and learn from him, from his experiences about climate change. They have, there is out there a lot of traditional knowledge and we have to reach out to that. 
I would like to um, ask you to, ask, ask to, the to, to join us because he's uh, representing the youth uh, um, in this uh, debate. So he can um, share with us what his point of views uh, are uh, regarding uh, the climate change and the impact on our islands. Hello, hello. I'm super glad to be here. Super glad to see every one of you. Um, thank you for your patience. I am here. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I think I, I read your notes and I heard a part of what you were talking about. And I think it's so important that we focus on projects and on creating stuff on the ground and especially on community. And I feel what we often lack and we often miss in these conversations is why are we incapable of executing projects? Um, we often we talk about vision and I've read a lot of these reports that we make in Curacao. They're high quality, top tier. It's amazing. But often the biggest struggle comes into executing and implementing things on the ground. And there are multiple reasons why, right? It's it's often because we don't value um, this, this idea of practicing emotional and social intelligence within our education system. Um, we don't teach people that. We don't create the space um, for this communication that is open and people to actually have self-reflection as a practice, not just as a something you learn. Look, um, and I think it's so important to talk about education when we talk about climate, right? Because again, climate is a systemic crisis. It is a systemic crisis that impacts our islands disproportionately. So Curacao, Aruba, and especially Bonaire, um, we're all going to suffer very badly because of climate change. You know, we see we see the maps in Bonaire. We see um, weather changes in Curacao and how that impacts fisheries and how that impacts trade and et cetera, et cetera. So we know that it's here. The question is, how can we create the collective action on the ground that is needed to enact this change? And, and I think that's often what we miss in these conversations, right? And I think the suggestion of uh, Professor Marcina um, to uh, offer a workshop uh, on these uh, teams, that's a good starting point, I think, for also to uh, involve the youth uh, with, this, uh, with this theme, don't you think? I feel, I think one of the challenges for us is that we need to understand why young people are not engaging. Young people are not engaging because they're disenfranchised. Young people are not engaging because they don't feel that they have a voice. They don't feel that their voice matters. It is a very hierarchical top-down relationship. And when we wanna talk about creating change, um, it requires everybody to come to the table with their full agency and to come with the willingness to work and to come with the willingness to do something and to feel as though the effort that they are putting in is reflected in the work and in the outcome. And, and I think that's a challenge for us, right? I think that's a challenge that we need to work on. Um, I don't think it is a lack of funding, to be honest. Obviously, we do have a lack of resources. We do, we do. That's that's it's very clear. A lot of projects can't get funded, they can't get off the ground, but so much more is possible if we are able to harbor the strength of collective action. And when we can fine tune and coordinate in a way that is effective and impactful, then this change is gonna happen because you can give people these skills, but if people, when they start working together, they start fighting or um, it's, it becomes ego driven or um, you know, um, it, it ends up in, 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 in people, somebody didn't execute the work or there was a lack of communication. What happens with all this funding, it gets wasted. And a lot of what we're having is wasted because of the lack of human coordination and social skills. Yes, I, I want to, uh, sorry, I, I want to uh, emphasize a comment that uh, one of the participants uh, uh, stated in the uh, Q&A uh, session. It's, uh, John is uh, stating that I am of the opinion that the ideas and projects should be given more attention to the public. A weekly article in a newspaper would be a very good initiative for this department of University of Curacao. What's your take on this, uh, Professor Pacina? I think um, nowadays we, 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 we concentrate on doing, give information on the internet of newspaper. I believe more to get them involved, invite them 
to attend a, a seminar, a workshop, so we can talk directly to each other. And I, I have to comment uh, on the what Gilberto said. <laughs> I, I cannot more agree with you. And you did remember me why they are not getting involved, the youth. When I introduce participative management at the water plant to get the operators involved. And in that time, I also developed a leadership motivational model, what I call efficacious motivation leadership to engage, especially the workflow personnel and motivate them and empower them to work. And in the beginning, when I start doing that, I, I, I suddenly said, my God, what if I am beginning to do? Because always when you see the phases of team formation, the first thing is storming. Indeed, <laughs> you can start, you, you will begin to fight to each other. But the most important thing is, the reason is because most of the time, most in, in the past, they were not heard. Man, upper management didn't take, they, they take them for granted. So when you involve the youth and operators at the workforce, they start getting fight to fight with you. But you have to have the patience to listen to them. And, and Actually, I have to say, the Department of Water Production was one of the worst department at the, the, the web facility. When we got the partic particip uh, participating management system and what I call the efficacious motivation leadership model in place, I don't know if you know, but it is recognized by the uh, most of the people of the International Desalination Association as one of the best operating uh, department in what, seawater desalination. And it's only because the operators, the workflow, not only operate, but also the maintenance workflow personnel were motivated, were involved and empowered to do so. So I think uh, that's why I strongly believe that to get things done on our island, we should involve the local community. Okay, and that's uh, Professor Marcina. I want to um, close this uh, session, the EU dialogue uh, session. Thank you uh, for your uh, uh, comments and your questions and all the, the inputs. I want to move on now to the um, next session about the funding opportunities because we were talking about the lack of uh, funding. Uh, although uh, Gilberto stated that uh, he doesn't think that that is the, the main problem, but I think that it's a good uh, idea now to um, see what funding opportunities there are regarding uh, blue and green. And um, I want to welcome our speaker, uh, Joseph Stuver from the Dutch Research Council. He will uh, share with us uh, his view and the opportunities that uh, NWO uh, offers regarding or about uh, blue and green uh, initiatives. So, um, Mr. Stufer, the floor is yours. Mr. Stufer, you can unmute. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, session. <clears throat> um, I'd like to uh, update you today on some of the uh, NWO research funding opportunities, uh, which, uh, which we have. And um, so I will first introduce NWO as a organization, then come to some green and blue um, opportunities within the whole funding uh, spectrum. And finally, I will share some, <clears throat> some um, uh, tips and tricks I, I uh, put down here, but it will be some general advice on how to uh, be successful in working with, uh, with the NWO. May I have the next slide, please? 
<clears throat> Before introducing uh, NWO, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a senior program manager and policy advisor at the <clears throat> Dutch uh, Research Council, and I'm working there uh, since uh, 2009. My main responsibilities are uh, the Caribbean Research Program. I'm the coordinator of this uh, program, which is uh, dedicated to research um, on and about uh, uh, Caribbean topics. <clears throat> on top of that, um, I'm also responsible for research programs on uh, water and climate. And uh, I'm also uh, doing quite a lot of uh, research programs, uh, uh, or I'm advising on the research program, international and European uh, research programs. My own background is in academic 